Welcome to the first session of PCST 2023 online. We have a fabulous lineup today. And in fact, all week we've got uh, some wonderful presentations. Uh, in this session, our presenters, we've got five presenters, will be exploring how important and potentially life-saving information is communicated to different audiences and how practices are adapted and developed to account for differences in perspectives. Uh, we'll be recording all of these sessions and making them available. And uh, I'd like to thank you for coming along and participating in that this session. You can ask questions in the chat, so feel free as we go along. We'll have time for a few questions after each presentation and hopefully a little bit of time for discussion at the end, because I think that we can perhaps bring together some of these uh, themes. Um, but I'd like to introduce our first presenter, and it's Claire Mullen from the Australian Bureau of Meteorology. And Claire's talking about building climate resistant resilience in the Pacific, the early action rainfall watch service. Welcome, Claire. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, everyone. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining in your various time zones. Hopefully, I'm not interrupting your dinner too much. Um, my talk is communicating drought in Pacific island countries. I'm a meteorologist who works at the Bureau of Meteorology in Australia, who's really been focusing on communicating the information that we have for many, many years. So I've been working with the COSPAC project for um, about not quite 18 months. Uh, COSPAC is Climate and Ocean Support in the Pacific and the Australian Weather Bureau works with uh, weather bureaus in other Pacific Island countries, 15 different countries, and the uh, red arrows are places that I was fortunate enough to be able to travel to in country last year. So that was Vanuatu, Fiji and Kiribati. So um, why is this work important? What is the cost of drought? Um, in short, water is life and you can't survive without it. If you have a shortage of water, your crops are affected, your rain tanks are affected, you can't flush your toilets as well as you used to, um, hygiene goes down, it um, has, <clears throat> excuse me, multiple effects across um, communities and businesses. And um, teeny tiny Pacific countries don't always have as many choices in dealing with drought as uh, larger countries might do in being able to find alternates to water. So being able to do some pre-planning, if you know that there's dry times coming up is very important. So they talk about um, early warning and early action being really important. So what makes these changes? Across the Pacific Ocean, there's a couple of systems called La Nina and El Nino that countries either side of the Pacific know about because it, it has um, effects across the Pacific and actually in other parts of the world as well. Um, it's about changes in the ocean that changes the weather patterns across the Pacific and um, shifts the rainfall out of its normal places so you don't get the rainfall you normally expect. So the biggest learning for me in this project in the last year or so is that um, these words, these changes mean different things in different places. So Australia's pretty well versed on El Nino and La Nina, especially um, for people like Michelle from Queensland, they understand that um, El Nino means drought more often than not, particularly across Eastern Australia. This maps actually uh, rainfall, rainfall percentages over the last two years. So the places in the red zone have only had five to 10% of their usual rainfall over a two year period. So that's you know hardly anything from what you would normally expect. Uh, the places in the blue zone have had um, probably more rainfall than they've ever seen. So La Nina in Australia means floods, but in for countries in the red zone means drought. So um, what sort of impacts do you expect in the top left-hand corner? That's an image from Kiribati. Kiribati has the geographical spread of Australia across the Pacific, but it's actually just a bunch of tiny islands. And um, when they run out of 
uh, water, there's not a lot of options. So often um, the government and the humanitarian organisations have to kick into gear and start um, shipping bottled water to these tiny nations. On the right hand side is um, images from Vanuatu. Normally they have a wet season and a dry season and people love to go visit in the winter because it's uh, warm and dry. Um, in La Nina, Vanuatu goes wet. So in the top left hand corner, there's water almost up to the um, undercarriage of the aeroplane, which is a lot of water. So how do we communicate this information? So we've been working with these different uh, weather bureaus and there's a bulletin where we communicate this information. It's a four page bulletin. It's quite technical. There's lots of words. There's maps straight out of the computer. That's probably good for uh, technical people, but not so good for trying to get that information down to community level or to last mile, as we say. So what what sorts of channels and uh, choices can we use to communicate this information? For the top audience, um, the bulletin that I just showed you, they can issue via a website or a, an email to stakeholders or do um, direct briefings, often to drought management committees who need to make decisions about what to do next. For trying to get that information down to um, community level or last mile, um, media releases can be helpful if that information can be communicated through the media, through TV and newspapers and radio. Um, social media is pretty popular in uh, many countries and uh, Facebook in particular in many Pacific countries. Also how you communicate that information, maybe less words and more um, graphics, um, especially if uh, people are speaking different languages or um, don't have the same amounts of literacy as the um, big national organisations. So here's a sample of some of the um, things we've been playing with to try and communicate this information to um, community level uh, uh, graphics on um, social media through the Weather Bureau or the Meteorological Services. Most of them have their own Facebook page where they can control the information. This sample is from the Fiji Meteorological Service. It's probably got a lot of words on it for a social media graphic, but at least it's one step in trying to communicate how the rainfall's been, uh, what's coming up ahead, and um, maybe what the impacts might be or some actions that you can take. <clears throat> this sample is from the Cook Islands Meteorological Service. Um, lots of great use of colours and pictures. The text is probably um, impossible to read on my slide, sorry for that. And again, maybe a bit much for a, a usual social media graphic that's pretty short, but at least it's an attempt of trying to break down that technical bulletin information into things that the community um, would understand. Um, this is a graphic from the Vanuatu Meteorological Service. Um, as I said, so for some people La Nina means wet and for other countries La Nina means dry, but certainly in Vanuatu it means wet. So when they put up their La Nina dial, they also have the rainfall stripes to go with it to show that La Nina means wet for them. Um, even better in their local countries if they can translate into local language. Uh, this is a sample from Vanuatu. Vanuatu has three different official languages, English, French and Bislama. So this bulletin they um, first do in English and then they translate into Bislama, which is fantastic, but um, all this thing takes time. So you have to figure out where you're going to use your resources, do this in English or do it locally better locally, especially for community level. Um, this is a sample of a sign in Kiribati. It's on uh, one of the, well, there's really only one main road up and down the Atoll Island of Kiribati. Um, so this is on one of the um, waterway stretches. As you can see, uh, there'd be lots of passing traffic who would see it in a pretty popular spot. But um, if you put up a sign in a small island country, you need to keep up the maintenance because it doesn't hold together so well. And I'm told that the, um, the dial in the middle is a, what they call an ENSO dial to show if you're in El Nino or La Nina conditions. And unfortunately on that sign, um, it needs um, someone to come and spin the dial. And because it's a bit rusty, the dial's actually a bit stuck. So that's not so great either. Something to think about when you're communicating this information. 
Um, last year when we were in country, we managed to do a few stakeholder, stakeholder um, testimonial videos. So um, we filmed the local um, Mitelli, his name is, from the National Disaster Management Office in Fiji, and he was able to describe when I get this bulletin, this is what I do next to try and help the, the um, country prepare when we're expecting floods. So that was really useful, and we had a few different testimonials that we filmed and were able to put up on uh, Fiji Met Service Facebook to show how this product could be used. Was that my flash, Michelle? That was, yeah, one minute ago. Oh, that was it. I got it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this is an infographic that we've been developing with stakeholders. So the colours on the back are about how much rainfall that's been. Uh, the icons that we're using, uh, some stakeholders wanted buckets, some stakeholders wanted water tanks. This is all in local language, language in Tuvalu. And um, basically the amount of water is um, what you're expecting for the months ahead. So it's an outlook for the next three months. If you've got a water tank full of blue water, expect rain. If you've got a water tank with not much water in it, um, think about some uh, alternate ways or start um, saving your water. So the lessons that we learned, uh, Facebook is pretty handy for getting out social media messages in these countries. Um, fantastic if you can do it in local language, um, using country appropriate icons on the forecast, like a water tank. Uh, sign boards are good as long as you look after them. And um, yeah, this project ran through COVID and we tried to do lots of things online, but um, we were very pleased when um, we were all able to travel again and work collaboratively together because it's um, being there in person is much um, better and more effective than online. Our possible future work is uh, we did some work with farmers far removed from the city who said, my internet's not so great, but I'd love you to tell me about this on the radio. Um, we're working on some education videos and the infographics, and we'd love to see more communication offices in the Pacific Meteorological Services. This is a quick photo um, in Fiji. There's a local custom called Kalavata, which is um, you're from the same family. So uh, we all went to the uh, local shop and made sure we all had uh, matching buller shirts, which was fantastic. And Thanks, again, Claire. Um, we, That's thank great. you. We'd love that's to see fun. more comms offices in the Pacific. I'll stop now. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. No, that's great. No, that's good. Um, there might be some opportunities. We've got some time for a few questions. So I, I invite you now, if you are uh, online um, and would like to type one in the chat or uh, you can ask it, you can put your um, your uh, sound on. But Claire, I'm really fascinated by the infographics and maybe I'd just like to know how do you keep them, I guess, because a lot of those infographics on social media are shareable, how do you keep them evergreen? You know, I can see with the sign, things can move you so you can communicate different things in different seasons. But what? how do you manage that with infographics? Have you, you know, is there a particular life and how do you, yeah. It's an excellent question. Um, just like a, a weather forecast is up, updated every day, these forecasts are actually updated once a month. So particularly at this time of the year, we're coming out of a La Nina and we've gone into an El Nino watch. So from an evergreen point, we just uh, ideally each time the new ear watch bulletin is issued, you would put up a new social media graphic, which is about once a month. Yeah, that's great. So people know they're coming. Um, any questions? Any questions for Claire? We can leave them till the end. What? What? With the, again with the infographics because I think that's the way everything is going that we see in science communication. What are some of the big things you learned? I heard you say a few times, "Too much text." We know, but you know, what? What other sorts of things are you feeling? It's a, it's a constant uh, challenge trying to talk the scientists down from because um, there's lots of things that they want to tell you in lots of text. But um, uh, it's something that we're developing with stakeholders and even just choosing a water tank or a bucket is something completely different. I think normally uh, weather bureaus think about sunshines and clouds and temperatures and stuff. So to represent what happens next, 
Um, one of the biggest challenges for us is we want to move forecasts from um, what the weather is doing to how it will affect you. So to be able to pair with other organisations who can start talking about impacts, you know, to know that it's going to be dry the next few months is one thing, but to be able to put in the, the next step, you know, who do I contact, what do I do? So that's probably an action um, work for us ahead as well. Correct. Yeah, what do I do? Yeah. And know, local to action. Yeah, mm -hmm. that'd be really yep. contextual, wouldn't it? Yes, so. that'd be awesome. Well, good, good work, work being first off the rank of presentations because I think everybody's just still mm -hmm. warming into it. So, yeah, if you've got a question for Claire or you see connections between the uh, presentations, we'll have some time at the end, hopefully. So, but yeah, thanks very much, Claire. That's wonderful. I'm going Thank to, uh, I'm going to replace. Um, Wenchi uh, now. Um, so our next presenter uh, is Wenchi uh, Tan and she's from Nanyang uh, Technological University and she's talking about um, how can communication practices include people with uh, ambulatory disabilities and older uh, adults in autonomous public transport development. Uh, take it away, Wenchi. Thank you for the introduction, Michelle. So I'm coming from Singapore and I'm a current master's student in the Week in Week School. And this today I'm actually presenting for the first time a part of my master's thesis. So it's really exciting. So as Michelle said, I'm talking about uh, how communication practices specifically related to autonomous public transport development can include people with ambulatory disabilities and older adults, two really important groups that have been historically excluded from and face barriers in public transport. So I'll head right into it. First of all, autonomous public transport uh, for everyone here refers to autonomous vehicles that are part of a country's public transport system, like autonomous shuttles for on-demand point-to-point transport on the top of the slide here, as well as autonomous buses for scheduled services on the bottom. So I'll be working within the context of autonomous public transport in Singapore for multiple reasons, but mainly because Singapore's public transport authority has really touted autonomous public transport to afford many benefits, uh, like convenience and accessibility of travel to people with ambulatory disabilities and older adults. And in addition to this, disability and aging have been frequently spotlighted in the sp social imagination and media presentation of autonomous public transport here in Singapore. And specifically, they're used to punctuate why the technology would be beneficial for the country. However, there's really been limited evidence in both practice and communication of how exactly autonomous public transport would be beneficial for these groups, and also very scarce evidence of these groups' involvement in the actual development itself. And finally, there has been no distinction, little to no distinction between the needs and preferences of people with ambulatory disabilities and older adults and they largely treat them as this homogenous group that would uniformly benefit from autonomous public transport. And this is despite them presenting as very different and often quite resistant identities that have had distinct historical experiences with public transport accessibility. So this brings me to the theoretical orientation of my research, which I will go through quite briefly. I am guided by Andrew Feenberg's critical theory of technology, which basically asserts that technology design is developed through layers of technical and social standards. Technical standards being ones that you would know like efficiency, productivity, and social standards being those like accessibility and other ethical and aesthetic reasons. So the values that a technology design ultimately inherits may be biased towards the social, political, economic conditions in which that technology is produced in. So for example, you expect technology to be, to be biased towards institutions in power uh, with the interest of public transport authorities taking precedence in this case, for example, or the majority population. However, the critical theory of technology also suggests that the standards that technology is founded upon can be subverted and modified by adding additional layers of social input. And these are through processes that are known as democratic interventions. So these interventions importantly enable social actors to communicate their demands and ideas so that the technology they use can actually, actually be useful and representative of their needs. And often these interventions are undertaken by minority groups so they can incorporate their interests into technologies that are quite often biased against them. So there are two types of interventions that I'm interested in for this research, which is innovative dialogue and participatory design. 
So like the name su suggests, innovative dialogue is the deliberation between expert and public groups to generate new knowledge, while participatory design is a co-creation of solutions by different expert and lay stakeholders. And you would find these quite um, familiar because they find commonality with a framework that I'm sure everyone here is more familiar with, which are the models of public science communication and specifically the modes of democratic interventions I highlighted earlier find agreement with the dialogical and participatory models of science communication. So the goal of this research really reflects science, commu science communications um, assertion that you should be encouraging more two-way modes of science communication. So this research first recognizes a need for close collaboration with affected marginalized social groups to create a technology that will be useful for them. It also recognizes that the current reality, there's little to no communication with these affected social groups. And there's also a lack of a gold standard for these forms of communication, as well as a need for more equitable opportunities for these social groups to input their interests in technology design. So given the centrality of disability and aging to autonomous public transport discourse, I asked how can communication practices facilitate the inclusion in autonomous public transport development. So that, to that end, I conducted a series of online, online focus group discussions with 20 people with ambulatory disabilities and with 21 older adults. And each focus group session, either entirely with people with disabilities or with older adults, had six to seven participants per session. I provided participants with a brief introduction to autonomous public transport through video, photographs, and a verbal script and use a semi-structured design, a discussion guide to moderate the focus groups and both the guide and the introductory information were verified to be accurate by an expert on autonomous vehicles in Singapore. So I'll first share quite touch and go what participants thought about current avenues for them to communicate their perspectives about autonomous public transport. So our participants with ambulatory disabilities viewed there to be generally insufficient or inadequate channels available. And beyond that, they actually drew from their prior experience of inclusion in or exclusion from public transport development and said that there was really a lack of engagement from the top down. So while several participants have experience in consultative roles or in discussion groups hosted by these public transport authorities, they were largely one off and not iterative. Uh, particip participants also shared that there were no accessible ways to provide continual feedback. They also felt that this, these existing attempts at inclusion were not very meaningful for them. So when participating in these consultations or discussions, they felt like they were asked to provide their opinions when development decisions were already a done deal and perceived that authorities were asking them just for the sake of asking them. Participants were also pretty skeptical over the impact of these inclusion attempts and they specifically perceived the hierarchy in whose voices these institutions chose to give the most weight to with people who are actually holding that lived experience of being disabled, being placed at the bottom of the hierarchy with preference for people who are experts. So likewise, older participants were also unaware of any channels available to communicate their perspectives about autonomous public transport. But unlike participants with ambulatory disabilities who had some experience in consultative or dialogical positions, older adults really only had experience with one way from feedback. And you'd see this uh, being provided through an application, email, phone calls, about day-to-day -day dissatisfactions with public transport. Yet, even with these limited experiences, they still felt like these available avenues were insincere as they didn't have a name, they don't see a face behind who they're giving feedback to. So really a lacking of that human uh, connection. And they also felt like their feedback was not taken seriously. Like participants with ambulatory disabilities, they further expressed skepticism over the impact of their feedback. They felt that they also had limited power to influence decisions and the incorporation of their feedback was ultimately dependent on whether their ideas would be acceptable to public transport operators. So when it came to how participants wanted to be included in autonomous public transport development through these dialogical and participatory channels, really only participants with ambulatory disabilities articulate, articulate, articulated these desires and preferences. So specifically, their responses echoed with the motto of the disability rights movement worldwide, nothing about us without us, and called for greater inclusion in the autonomous public transport development process. So first, they called for inclusion from the onset of development, rather than trying to retrofit an inaccessible technology after deployments. They also desired sincere engagement that actually involved them in that decision-making process and rejected non-disabled people making assumptions about their preferences. 
And third, as their prior experiences have limited them to only having conversations with operators and authorities, they really wanted that direct communication with engineers and designers of the technology uh, to personally share their experiences and information. They also asked for greater decision-making power and to stand on an equal footing with the current largely non-disabled decision makers, especially when it came to matters that affected them. Fifth, drawing back to their current experience, they also called for more routine and iterative communication. And finally, they called for a broader representation of different disability identities as well. So comparatively, older adults really only raised their preferences for the one-way forms of feedback that they were familiar with, so the emails, the application. But their preferences also seem to call for greater sincerity and reciprocity from the operators, uh, asking for inclusion before deployment, as well as sincere and concrete reception. People with ambulatory disabilities also did want to raise a day-to-day -day dissatisfactions through more accessible and convenient channels. So very quickly, what does this all mean? We know that autonomous public transport is not accessible, yet little is being done to understand and really include these social groups. Uh, avenues are inadequate, inconsistent, and importantly, there's a really low awareness of dialogical and participatory involvement among older adults. So you see ambulatory disabilities being included, but not older adults. They only knew these one-way forms of feedback. And um, these I ran through earlier, so I'll just skip through it. And most importantly, it's just that the research calls for a greater recognition of marginalized group interests in technology design through dialogic and participatory means. And even though my research is really about disability and aging, I do feel that it is relevant to a lot of forms of accessible science and technology communication, especially when it comes to things like inclusion from the onset. And I think I will end there. Thanks, Thank Wenchi. You. That's wonderful. I think we'd all be clapping now if we weren't uh, on online. So that's a marvelous, so much is resonating for me. Um, uh, Claire and I were involved very early on. Yeah, that's good. Thanks, uh, thanks, Amy. Um, Claire and I were involved in some consultation work, you know, decades ago, and that whole sense of wanting to be included earlier and feeling like uh, there were powerful interests that dominated, you know, that we're still having these uh, struggles. So I think talking, consulting people about how they want to be consulted is, yeah, really um, important. And I'm just yeah, wondering... Like it's a... Oh, sorry, oh, sorry, sorry you no, well, I was just wondering, you said about the disability rights, how did the advocacy groups, um, it, how, how did they, was it just individuals or was there a sense that advocacy groups could be um, involved? Are there advocacy groups for disability? Yeah, definitely. So a lot of the participants that we recruited were actually part of advocacy groups. We reached out to a lot of disability organizations in Singapore to get our participants. So they all had a foot in sort of this kind of recurrent struggle over inclusion and things like that. So the general sense that we get is that public transport operators, they do engage disability groups when it comes to decisions about public transport, right? But it always happens after decisions are made. So it looks like they're, they're always in a kind of retrospective position, like, is what we're doing good enough? Do you want to change anything? And then they're also not very sure whether their feedback will actually be incorporated. And we're kind of seeing this recurrent cycle for autonomous public transport now, right? So currently in Singapore, trials are being held, so like pilots are going out. But yet, a lot of these disability organizations, and we know that because they're the main disability organizations in Singapore, they're not being contacted about to share their preferences and opinions. A lot of our participants shared that this was basically their first dialogue session that they ever had about autonomous public transport, quite unfamiliar with the topic, they weren't engaged with trials. So we do see kind of this like recurrent issue of um, technology is developed and then disability groups are engaged to share their opinions afterwards. Um, but, uh, have we got any other questions? Cause I've got some follow-up, but I'm just wondering, oh, here we go, Claire. Um, do you have any tips on how to improve participatory design? <laughs> I think we've struggled with this. So it's a constant challenge, she said, for us as well, getting good participation, developing products. For community. Yeah, it's a big issue, right? Because um, I don't come from the school of design, right? I come from communication, so it's really more about like speaking out your ideas. But the sense I get is just you really want to talk to people who are affected. So like if you're designing a product to be accessible and you know that I'm reaching a particular set of 
audience and end users, you want to talk to them to know like, um, is what I'm doing good enough? Is what I'm doing, you know, really going to be helpful and useful for you? And the best way you can do it is to interact with them, let them try out your product, your service. You see whether there are any gaps that are not being fulfilled. You see whether there's any like barriers to use. Yeah. So I feel like a lot of it is about getting, um, creating this sort of like form of empathy and connection with the end users of whatever you are designing. Yeah, it's this, it's, it comes down to resources and prioritizing those things, doesn't it? Um, Andrea says, not a question because when she, when she spoke, oh, okay. I'm so sorry. Um, oh, it's, we've got so little time, but yeah, this is recorded. So, and Wensi, I'm sure you're writing up some of this work. So that'll be a nice thing. All we have time for is an ad, but yeah, I'm sorry if I'm rushing everyone through. We've got quite a bit to um, go on with, but yeah, we'll have these recorded so you can always go back and, and have a look. Um, but yeah, thanks very much, uh, Wenchi. We'll have to um, we'll have to get on. Um, yeah, um, Marina said, yeah, she enjoyed. So thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is uh, Gan Pensi, and um, he is speaking about femininity as a medium, the grassroots communication practice of female barefoot doctors. So, yeah. Thanks for me, Cheryl. Can, can everyone see my slides and hear me? Yep. Um, um, okay. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Gan Pensi from School of Journalism and Communication. Um, the topic I'm sharing today is femininity as a medium, the grassroots communication practice of female barefoot doctors. Uh, sorry. Um, first of all, I would like to briefly introduce my research subject, barefoot doctors. Um, this is a term that began to appear in the mid 1960s and 1970s during the Cultural Revolution uh, in China. Uh, referring to healthcare workers without a fixed establishment who disseminated the primary medical knowledge. Mm. My research focuses on the gender factor among barefoot doctors from the perspective of cultural studies. I, ha I have chosen this topic because I found almost all barefoot doctors in the official propaganda were female. But in reality, there were more male barefoot doctors than female. So it's evident that there was a contradiction between the uh, official propaganda and the actual situation. So I think that the official believed that femininity itself can be used as a medium to achieve a certain communication effect. Mm. My main method is textual analysis. I draw on Roland our semiotics to reveal how the femininity of the female barefoot doctors became a myth through the analysis of specific viral elements. Uh, the main ma materials I used were articles from People's Daily and the viral media materials from China pictor pictor um, pictorial, <laughs> rather than focusing on the authenticity of them, I want to find out what kind of official expectations of female barefoot doctors were, reflect, re, were reflected behind these materials. So um, my report wants to address two questions. Uh, firstly, what were the futures of the propaganda of female barefoot doctors? To answer this question, we can look at the back cover of the January 1968. On 66 issue of China Pictorial, Doctor in the Mountain Village. But in fact, the painting itself was from 1963, and the pro prototype of the work was actually a female um, educated youth, um, Zhi Qing, treating, treating her own wounds. So, as can be seen, the process by which the painting itself was discovered reflected the fact that it does not matter whether the Jacked in the picture was a barefoot doctor or not. What mattered was that her future met the official requirements for a barefoot doctor. Mm, a visual an analysis of the drawing revealed the following set of visual elements the bright red flowers, long, naturally curling brides, the warm but not overly bright light, 
These became symbolic expressions of the female barefoot doctor's femininity. Her red lip and fragile expression reflected that she was a traditional Chinese beauty. Uh, in fact, there did not seem to, um, to be too much difference between the person in the painting and the women uh, embroidered in the classical painting. Both of them had the same gentle and delicate femininity instead of the iron girl image that prevailed after the establishment um, of New China, which encouraged women, women to have a view of steel. The second question is, what was the special role of the femininity of female barefoot doctors in grassroots practice? We can start by um, citing material from the January 1969 issue of China um, Pictorial, which published an article entitled um, Barefoot Doctors Are Good, since it was already in the period of the Cultural Revolution. The first half of this story reflected a strong sense of class struggle, and both, both photos were in black and white. However, uh, the style of the second half of the photograph changed as the space being photographed changed. The female barefoot doctors in the next few pictures are smiling, surrounded by the rustic landscape of lush felt grasses behind them. This is a strong expression of um, ver vernacular nature. The prominence of labor, smells, caring, and scenery in the picture actually emphasize the gentle femininity of the female barefoot doctors connected with vernacular nature. Mm, such propaganda is of various uh, special significance. The barefoot doctors needed to promote medical knowledge at the grassroots level. However, the customers and habits formed in vernacular societies for thousands of years often contradict modern medical practice and without transforming dogmatic professionalism and transforming the doctor-patient relationship into a countryside model of acquaintance communication, it's so difficult to make practical achievements in the propagation of local medical and health knowledge. So it's through their unique femininity of gentleness, um, attentiveness, and care, as well as their futures of being guardians of the countryside with multiple responsibilities, that female barefoot doctors formed a link to uh, the countryside, moderated con um, conflicts, and advanced the localization of m medical knowledge. In this sense, um, female barefoot doctors are similar to the organic intellectuals in Gramsci's writing. Mm, however, in oral histories, we can see the misalignment between the of, um, official propaganda and the reality of the barefoot doctors. A fem female barefoot doctor cannot be merely gentle and stay at home. She still can't avoid the double constraints of public um, labor and domestic work, and she had no high well, feminist male beauty and harmony, um, but also had to develop a stale eye and mas um, masculine physique in the midst of hardship and danger. Um, my conclusions are mainly above. So finally, I believe that my research can generate some um, dialogue with the academic community in the following three aspects. Um, firstly, the knowledge dissem uh, disseminated by barefoot doctors is essentially a a uh, mass culture, uh, mass science, which opposes the restriction of science to a small circle of professional researchers and uh, emphasizes the participation on, and the contribution of the general public to scientific research and technological innovation. Um, secondly, the relationship between science and technology, the social state and the fem um, femininity, is always assumed that science and the technology are more associated with masculinity and that Chinese women during the socialist period were degendered iron girls. I hope my discussion of the topic of female barefoot doctors will broaden people's knowledge of it. The image of women during the Cultural Revolution can be reduced simply to iron girl model. The iron girl never repre represents the totally of the state propaganda. The state pro um, propagated different images to meet different purposes. When there is a short, shortage of in industrial labor and women need to be 
encouraged to go out of the home for employment, um, the air, um, iron grow, which emphasizes degenerating, comes into being. Well, if one wants to emphasize socialist modernization while conforming to the vernacular order and trying to improve local um, medical conditions, then one needs to use the coupling of the barefoot doctor's femininity and the um, vernacularness. So last but not least, the relationship between science communication and the movement-based governance of the state. Barefoot Doctors is a movement that Mao Zedong started in line with Zhou Shiguang's movement-based governance. However, um, in order for official actions to be effective, they must respect, res respect the um, specific of local societies and embed their sense communication practice in the local vernacular cultural context. Um, this is my sharing. Thanks for listening. <laughs> I'm so, a little nervous. Sorry, sorry. Thanks, Gan. That's wonderful. Um, really interesting research. And I'm always interested in those boundary spanners, those people that sit between uh, real social uh, grassroots communities and science. So it's a really lovely case study. Um, I'll see. I think we've got a question in the uh, in the chat um, from uh, Annie. Uh, Annie, she's saying, I'd love to know your thoughts on why it was so important to represent barefoot doctors as sensitive and female versus the traditional knowledgeable doctor we often see in Western cultures. Um, uh, thanks for the, this question. I think uh, maybe the Western doctors um, mean to um, say it's Cities med, med, medical system, but the barefoot doctors are I mean um, are faced to um, um countryside. So um the barefoot doctors are not so professional doctors, and they must uh, um, observe the um, countryside cu customers. And uh, um, so um uh, I'm sorry. So they are they are action can be um, accepted by local residents. So thanks for listening. Um, I think we've got another question here. It's super important and interesting topic in Chinese history of science studies. So thank you. Um, do you think the Chinese government inherited or even rewrote the ancient Chinese feminine ideal uh, temperament? Uh, sorry, I just lost my slide, um, to some extent, so as to adapt to this revolutionary women of the 1960s rather than simply inheriting the so Soviet revolutionary style of feminine writing and Chinese propaganda. Mm, yes, I think it's, um, sh uh, it's um, adapted more than Chinese traditional um, instead of uh, Slovenian. I think it's based on the um, government, government uh, um, concrete purpose because um, because I think uh, um, Slovenia and growth um, is more like uh, um, 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 sorry. <laughs> um, That's okay. In that industrial pr production, but uh, um, but uh, one wants to um, um, barefoot doctors is more like uh, um, social um, emphasize socialist modernization will conforming to the vernacular order and and trying to local medical conditions or. So they are. Um, they, they need to um, adapt some traditional culture um, instead of some Slovenian um, iron growth to pro, um, industrial production. Yeah, cool. Uh, you yeah. you might want to um, respond in the chat to that as well because we're going to have to move on, and I think there's quite a bit to unpack there. So if you'd like to. Um, to yeah, respond um, in the chat. That'd be really wonderful. But yeah, great project. And I'm 
seeing connections with Claire's images at the beginning as well. You know, it's so important now, those real um, touchstones for us. Um, Thanks for me, So thank you very I'm much. So sorry. <laughs> no, it's wonderful. It's great. I'm, I'm glad you could be here. Um, so our next presenter is Joey Yang. And Joey is from um, Qingtan University and uh, speaking on good riddance. Are we still our world? <laughs> Intriguing title. Please don't be so uh, precise about science. The deliberate ambiguity of the dissemination of mater maternal infant knowledge in China. So welcome. Hello, everyone. My name is Zhi Yang from Xiangtai University. My co-author is Qing Xiao from Communication University of China. Today, I will be presenting on the topic of good readings. We are still in the old world. Please don't be so precise and about science. The deliberate ambiguity of the dissemination of maternal infant knowledge in China, 1941 to 1950. It is well known that there have been many research results on the spirit of modern scientific knowledge in ancient China during the early 20th century. However, in these studies on the spread of modern scientific knowledge, the dissemination of maternal and child health knowledge has not received much attention. Maternal and child health knowledge is a field that highlights the conflict between tradition and modernity. On the one hand, China has its own internal system of maternal and child knowledge that has been passed down for thousands of years. On the other hand, in the early 20th century, Western medicine had already begun to spread widely in China, and many progressive supporters of modern medical knowledge started medical journals to disseminate advanced medical knowledge to a wider audience. Although widely studied, comprehensive women's magazines with significant influence in China at that time, such as Women Magazine, published from 1915 to 1931, mostly provide scatter summaries by women themselves and a scatter introduction by individual doctors on maternal and child health knowledge. Today, I would like to talk about maternal and uh, child health, the first uh, professional magazine in China with the dissemination of maternal and child health knowledge as its main content and from the beginning. It has positioned itself as a magazine for popularizing maternal and child health knowledge. Analyzing the magazine will help us understand the dissemination mode of maternal and child health knowledge in China during the early 20th century. It is content scientifically accurate, deeply embedded in traditional superstition and rumors or in a mixed state. Now I will present the research findings in summary. The content of maternal and child health is a complex mixture of the traditional and the modern knowledge. Firstly, the contributors of the magazine actively translate scientific research results from abroad, according statistics uh, from 1941 to 1949, with the hiatus between 1942 and 1945, there were a total of uh, 487 articles published in maternal and child health, of which 62 were translation, accounting for 12% of the total. Uh, this also does not include the number of articles that were created based on the translated foreign articles. 
for example, in the volume two, issue three of Maternal and the Child Health, there is an article called Preparing for the Sanctification of Baby Clothes. Baby clothes. The original essence of this article is Anna Belling, uh, American. Uh, it reminds readers that the a baby's body temperature must be kept at an average of 1998 degrees Fahrenheit and the promote adjustment of clothing must be made accordingly. If the temperature exceeds 101 degrees for Fahrenheit, uh, medical attention must be sought. There is no such precious temperature conclusion um, requirement in traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, the introduction of this knowledge by the magazine was a challenge to the ch traditional Chinese behavior to perceive body temperature through harsh. Secondly, the folk stories were used and adopted. The magazine once published a story called Chang'e on the Moon. The story is utilized the ancient Chinese legend of Chang'e flying to the moon and imagined a physical changes that would occur in Chang'e organs while living on the moon. For example, the story mentioned that an ordinary person might blink their eyes thousands of times a day, but because there is no dust in the air on the moon, Chang'e would not need to blink and defend uh, against, against the dust invention. Uh, through the story, the answer cleverly linked uh, mathematical legends with modern medical and health knowledge, introducing readers to the foundation of the human body's organs and blending modern and ancient knowledge together. Third, in white, well, no Chinese healthcare professionals to contribute. I will manage to introduce a doctor named Song Mingtong, who had served as a director of Shanghai Railway Hospital and the head of pediatric department of Tongji Hospital during the Republic of China. He was in the charge of pediatric, pediatric Q&A section of the magazine's reader's mailbox, answering 75 reader questions and pro, providing appropriate treatment methods for those who describe their condition in detail and suggesting consulting the doctor to diagnose the cause and receive treatment for those with unclear description. Inviting this where no doctors to contribute went beyond the previous approach of summarizing female experience and having square it doctors write about family health knowledge instead. It presented healthcare professionals to the opportunity to introduce their work to the public and popularize maternal and infant health knowledge. First, actively use visual information. <clears throat> Ming the wife were the primary group to using comic strip and other forms to disseminate maternal and infant health and uh, some knowledge. Um, for example, a midwife named Zhang Xiuzhen had, had written 35 articles, while midwife Song Yuying had uh, written 12 articles and created, created uh, the long comic strip, Little Mao, to express her idea. And the comic strip, show here, titled No Longer Dare to Be a Hero, tells the story of how bandaging a wood can prevent bacterial invention and created by Zhang Xiuzhen, the transforming dry topics into vivid images and words. The drawing will lifelike uh, and uh, accompanied the textual exp explanation providing readers with health and um, knowledge while also entertaining them. In summary, the knowledge dissemination mode of maternal infant 
uh, instant health and uh, some uh, knowledge include a storytelling approach where modern med medical dissemination is achieved through folk medicine. The mixtures of Chinese traditional medicine and modern medicine has formed and become a effective mode and for disseminate maternal and child health knowledge. And this mode uh, not only conveys scientific knowledge, but also emphasizes preserving and promoting uh, the characteristics of Chinese traditional culture, uh, reflecting the harmonious um, unity of traditional culture and the modern civilization and having high research and practical value. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thanks, Jay. That's wonderful. That's great. You've packed a lot of work in there. You know, that's a that's a massive that's a massive project of analysis. Um, I'll wait to see if we get any uh, questions. You can put up your hand or you can um, type in the chat. But I was really fascinated by the uh, folklore, the folk stories. So oh, if you can stop sharing your slides, maybe um, Amy can uh, get hers up if that's okay, okay while we're having a bit of question time. Um, yeah, I was just interested in the in the because that whole scientization of folk stories, that whole storytelling. Were there other powerful examples, or did you see a lot of it, or was that just one that was shared a lot? Were there lots of folk stories that? Uh, yeah, we have a lot of stories. Like we made a very big data quantity research, and we collect uh, almost like three or two magazines from 1940 to 1950s and it's just one of the uh, stories and we think it's very, very interesting but we also have a lot of uh, stories here yep oh so so they were and were they regional oh actually there's other questions so i i can ask you this i'll, I'll put things under the youtube mm -hmm. video so i encourage you all but yeah i'm really interested in that folklore um story but i've got another question here from um wenchi wondering if you've seen any of these strategies yeah especially the one about folklore in current um day science communication in china so about maternal health or otherwise and yeah can you share the value if you've seen in using those you know what is it how can we apply this now or think about the value of that now mm -hmm. uh uh, actually, we do not focus on the contemporary journalism or contemporary science communication, but I think today's uh, Chinese uh, contemporary Chinese journalism is some, some to some extent related to the like the revolution China's strategies. Like you know, in the science communication, uh, Zhongguo, the very important Chinese channel in science communication, um, it's to some extent have some authority authority model like the. They do not care about the scientific reports or do not too much uh, focus on the scientific uh, statistics, but they focus on the some like talks uh, from the government, talks from the president, or some also folk, uh, like folk stories. Um, yeah, maybe you can uh, find a media called uh, uh, the Chinese Scientists, Zhongguo Kezhuejia. And it has a lot of folk uh, stories. Yeah, is that is that a website? Um, is that a website? Yeah, it's you a website. It's a social media. Yeah, yeah it's a social oh, media perfect. from the official. Yeah. Excellent. Maybe you could. Sh I don't know whether we can all access that around the world, but if we can, can you share a link in the chat? Because I think there'll be people who are very yeah, interested yeah, in yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, it's very okay. interesting. And I've got a message here from Linka, who I must say has done a fabulous organi organizing job with all of these talks. And she said she's going to follow up on the car uh, cartoons later. Um, so I think uh, you should get lots of um, connections. We'll um, we'll share your contact details. Um, so Linka knows and she can follow up on that. Uh, but our final presentation for today is uh, by Arnie. So I'm just going to get Arnie up on the screen and uh um Arnie 
Uh, Amy uh, Abu um, Shamsi is from the University of Malaysia, and she's going to be talking about framing COVID-19 booster dose, uh, action consequences and conflict. Over to you. Right. Thank you, Michelle. So hi, Reese. Get the booster shot. Get your booster shots. Initial immunity would have weighed the MMA just dose above 60. Boosters, best way to protect Malaysians. So what comes into your head when you see all these news headlines? Or another thing, why do we keep having all these news headlines? So it is undeniable that news media play important role, especially during COVID-19 pandemic. It is the source of information, correct misinformation, it encourages behavior change, it raises public awareness. And they do all this through influencing and shaping public perceptions through framing. And framing is, I cannot see my slides. Anyway, framing is to select some aspect of perceived reality and make them more salient in the communicating text, such as solution causes. It may affect the evaluation and interpretation of specific issues. Media framing can form a perception um, of the risk by the media and influencing the public responses, such as their behavior, reaction, decision making. Media framing could also lead us to understand the reason behind such news representation. Therefore, understanding the framing of the mass media on COVID-19 boosted dose issues can infer the factors that influence the production of this news content. I'm Dr. Dural Aini Abu Chamsi, and with my student, Noor Aisha Adil Akbar uh, from University of Malaya, we conducted a study on framing COVID-19 boosted dose action consequences and conflict. Just a bit of background on booster dose is basically the third dose after the second dosage, about 175 days for COVID-19 vaccine. It's basically to induce a strong immune response and protect against COVID-19 sickness and hospitalization, basically just to improve your immunization. Um, this is a timeline for Malaysian COVID-19 vaccination rollout. So from 2021, early of the year until 2022, we had a massive rollout throughout the country. Um, everyone get everyone gets vaccine. Um, except those who doesn't want to. Uh, COVID uh, government, but in September 2021, government examined the need for boosted dose COVID-19 vaccine. And the rollout of that boosted dose came in, 20, in the October following this um, examination. And fe February 2022, government announced it's compulsory for those who took Sinovac to receive boosted dose. And April 2022, um, second dose is um, offered to those with high risk patients, but it's still not obligatory and still not obligatory until today. So why do we do this study? It's basically online news is the main platform that can effectively shape society other than other platform through content presented to the public. Therefore, it must display um, the right accurate news and inspire people to do good. It is also important to understand the factor, the driving factors of such presentation in the news media. And to date, to date of the research done, I just Googled just now and there were studies similar to mine. Anyway, um, there has no research analyzing similar what I've done uh, on content news on COVID-19 vaccine boosted dose. So examining how the online is portrayed the boosted dose COVID-19 vaccine enable us to infer the production of the news. So these are the research questions, but basically we're looking at the trend of online news in Malaysia reporting issues related to COVID-19 vaccine booster dose. We also assess the pattern of the frames employed in those Also look at the dominant frames that use for that story. These are the two main um, theories guiding this study, which is agenda setting. Basically agenda setting tells you that media tells public what to think. Whereas framing is media tell you how to think about the particular issues. And literature review, most of the stories on vaccine are positive. Um, very small um, provide um, negative headlines. And pro-vaccination um, usually will receive um, you know, good sentiment. Um, interestingly, having these frames, which are consequences frame, action cues, cost, death, illnesses frame, 
safety efficacy will result in vaccine support. Do note that these are the frame for these frames. They are not limited to COVID-19, but also other vaccines such as influenza. So this is a theoretical framework. Basically, we use those agenda setting and framing to guide the data collection. And this is the research method. Um, basically, we did a content analysis. I actually just deleted the diagram on how we did the content analysis because it's a bit too complicated. But in total, we have about almost 800 um, articles um, based on the top 10 um, Malaysian news, which are, we only selected these two because it's accessible. The Star Online, which is in English language, whereas Berita Hariat Online, which are which is in Malay language. Time frame is between February 7, 2022 to May 2022. This is during examination of the um, posted dose to be rolled out up till when it's um, rolled out to the public. Um, the word keywords used to uh, find all this relevant news on booster dose are booster doses, dos pengala in Malay, and booster shots. We use frames, consequence, uncertainty, action, reassurance, conflicts, and new evidence. These are all based on the literatures on COVID, on vaccine um, analysis. <clears throat> Isn't what we found? So basically, when we compare these two news um, outlets, um, the English language the star actually covered more stories on vaccine booster dose. It has daily update on vaccine booster dose. A bit mouthful to mention it. Um, uh, compared to the, the other um, news outlet, which is Berita Harian. Um, but if you can see, the trend is keep decreasing week by week. And then when you look at the, the patterns uh, and the dominant frames, interesting, interestingly, both have similar patterns where you have action frame being mostly common in Malaysian news, followed by consequences. And you can see it's a bit like a double difference. The difference is like double between action and consequences, followed by uncertainty, reassurance. And on your on my right, um, conflict received the less most used um, frame in these stories. Um, this is just another analysis showing, you know, just showing the, the, the coverage, uh, the frame against the timeline um, between these two news. Um, still, you have the same uh, results. Consequ um, actions has the highest um, used in both uh, news outlets, followed by consequences. And again, conflicts has the least used in Malaysian news. Interestingly, so action frame was dominant. Um, so articles on action frame are basically about vaccination program for COVID-19 booster dose, promotion of acquiring booster do dose made by the government, organization, individual with high credentials, um, sultans, politician, lead of the state. So action frame is can be analyzed as a government propaganda action for the rollout of COVID-19 vaccine booster dose. And the consequence frame is basically focused on the side effect of the booster dose and, and also the impact of having booster dose on human life, social and economy. Thinkly, action and consequences frame are related to each other because um, if the, uh, with the increase of the booster dose uptake, which related to the action um, frame just now, the government comes out with the positive consequences of the booster dose. So that's why it's you know, re related to each other. Conflict frame, conflict frame are less frequent. Um, this is somehow similar to uh, another study that I've conducted on COVID-19 news. Um, and interestingly, if you compare COVID-19 news uh, in Malaysia with other global media organizations, um, they do have conflict frames being commonly used in other um, you know, major or giant global media organization like BBC, CNN, and Al Jazeera, but not in Malaysia. One of the reasons could be because the government wants people to take them and don't want to have any conflicts presented in the news so that everyone will get the dose. So action consequences show that media function as the government propaganda. It's a common practice in Malaysia. It shows that media has been positively portrayed government and media has been less critical with the government. And um, so it's also in line with Asian values and development journalism prevalent in Malaysia. Journalism, development journalism, basically the media producer should um, support the government policy to become a developed country, 
So in conclusion, news media in Malaysia mostly use action consequences framed to highlight in uh, promoting the COVID-19 vaccine booster dose. And the finding demonstrate that construct construction of COVID-19 booster dose is heavily influenced by the government. That's all from me. These are the references. Thank you from University Malaya, Malaysia. Thanks, Saini. That's wonderful. It's so good to see COVID-19 research still going on because we've still got so much to learn about the kinds of COVID communication um, that's coming out. And there was so much early vaccine communication work, so it's lovely to see um, building on this. Um, if you've got a question for Amy or for any of our presenters, we can open it up. But um, but yeah, Amy, what I'd like to um, ask you is I, what we saw in Australia was a lot of politicised vaccine communication. So there was official government, but there was also individual politicians. So we saw uh, essentially hijacking vaccine communication for their own political gain or political purposes. So I guess my first question is, was it the same in Malaysia or did everybody follow the government line early? And and if if you did see that individual, are you still seeing that kind of fractured government approach that was early on? That's what we saw. So I'd be really interested in so yeah, the I Malaysian experience. The very I think it goes back to my conclusion, is very heavily influenced by the government. When we say government is the Ministry of Health, so whatever they say, you have to support. So whoever against the idea, they will not be, they will not receive the mainstream media um, coverage. So you will get coverage, but not from you know all this mainstream. And even so, even if your words being mentioned in the media will receive negative highlights, negative framing. So there is no such, like I said, less conflict. Less conflict, everyone goes for vaccine, everyone's happy. But then again, if you're talking about social media, you're talking about all these other medias like blogs, um, you know, comments on social media, comments on social media, on the mainstream news, uh, Facebook accounts, um, those are not controlled by the government. So you have all, you know, you have all these different um, opinions. But yeah, okay. not yep. happening in Malaysia. So that's really interesting there, that context. So a comparison, looking at that in social media would be very interesting too. Yeah. Um, we've got a question from Alessandro who says, um, what was the role of independent science communicators in that context? Did, did some of them step up? Uh, and she sighs. <laughs> uh, first thing first, science communication in Malaysia is not something that is common. So... And I can say proudly that I can claim that I'm one of the people, a very small handful of people that claim we are working in science communication. Um, but it's different in health communication. Nevertheless, um, uh, I would say that if you have um, those who would see themselves as health communicators or science communicators, they would use their own platform, especially their social media account, Twitter or Facebook, then they can have their opinions. How, the way I see the pattern is that, and mostly this science communicator or health communicator, they are experts, they are either public health or they are people who are in science. Their words will only be taken by the government in a way that things that they mentioned in their um, social account it will take some time for the government to pick it up because maybe they are too busy with whatever um, promotion that they're working on. So they do have rules, but it's not you know, it's not that significant. It's not, maybe it's not that um, that prompt. There is, um, yeah, it's not, the government isn't that reactive. Unless yeah, you stir the pot in the social media, um, then um, there will be someone with a high credential and the government will address all the things. That's that's usually what happened. The, the people in the government will respond and then that will receive the coverage in the news. Excellent. Now we've got we've got one more question and we're going to be really quick. So um, if you want to stop sharing your screen, we can bring everybody back up. But Amy, yes. um, the questions from Joy, uh, there was an election um, during the COVID period in Malaysia. So did you see a change in the framing? I'm going to stop um, spotlighting um, everybody. So, we can just... Uh, no. <laughs> That's what I see because at the end of the day, even though... The, the government of the day um, can 
the end of the day, the policy of the government is done by the 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 officers, the okay, yeah. people who are not a politician. So it doesn't really they change didn't see the a lot. Yeah, great. Yeah, okay. No. We're out of time, folks. So I really want to uh, say a big thank you to you for being such wonderful presenters and for our wonderful audience. Uh, and I'd also like to thank uh, Linka and Marina, uh, who have been fabulous putting this program together and answered everybody's questions and accommodated everybody. So thank you again. We've got a wonderful program this week of speakers. We'll post this online and I love the idea of us keeping this conversation going. So I'll communicate with you and uh, and perhaps we can yeah answer some of those questions. Marina is here and perhaps she's got some final announcements uh, to make. Is there anything you'd like to say, Marina? Hi, hi, Michelle. I just want to thank you for your wonderful chairing and for you know being encouraging. I think this was an amazing session that really gave us me a lot of new insights. Um, thank you to the speakers. Um, I did post the link to the online program again in case people still want to think about the, and look at, at the program for tomorrow and uh, Wednesday. And this is like a warm up session, but we're starting on a very high note um, in, in the sense that it's building up to the main conference. But in a way, it's it's so amazing to have these sessions because it allows us perspectives and 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 a time to reflect that we wouldn't otherwise have. And I'm, I just want to assure all the speakers as well that there are many people around the world who have asked for these sessions to be available later because they couldn't you know, join in real time. So be assured that it will be exposed to a much larger audience. And, and thank you, Michelle. And also from my side, I could not have organized this without Linka. So thank you very much, Linka. Yeah, thanks very much. And I hope we get to see you somewhere in, wonderful in the world at some stage. Um, let's keep the conversation going because these issues are very close to my heart too, context and perspectives. So thanks very much. Bye, everyone.